I'm white and I've got everything I need No one clutches their purses when they're in a room alone with me And I can drive for any neighborhood I please At any hour and the police don't do a thing So if I see a penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got everything I need I'm a guy getting paid more than a girl with a degree And I can walk down the streets after dark, no one wants to rape me And I can get a girl pregnant and just as easily flee Just like my straight white male dad did to me So if I see a penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need I've got a pile of broken mirrors And I'm walking under ladders And I'm spilling tons of salt But to me that doesn't matter Cause my skin and my gender and my orientation Are the best things to have if you live in this nation I recommend it highly A penny on the ground I leave it alone and fucking flip it I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Shit's gonna work out for me Cause I'm a straight white male in America I've got all the luck I need Hey everybody, welcome to the Intellectual Dollar Tree. We uh, still do this show every Wednesday, 7 p.m. Pacific, right here on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. This is listener slash viewer supported uh, programming. So people on Twitch, you know how to support using the Twitch stuff, but also uh, eplex.store or patreon.com slash Echoplex for monthly recurring donations. Um, other things that help, just tell a friend about the show or tell an enemy about the show. Whatever, whatever. I am uh, producer Dave, or Gay Dave, and uh, you can find me on Grinder. And um, zip code going to be changing on that pretty soon. So um, I saw this. I don't know who Beckett Cook is, and I don't know who Doctor Nicolosi is. But um, what I'm going to show you is the is the still for this. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's not great. Oh, 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 everybody, this is live. It still isn't great. <laughs> this is what causes same sex attraction, everybody. This is that's what this is going to be about. Like I told Curiouser and Curiouser in the chat at the beginning of the show, uh, this one's not going to be fucking awesome. This is going to be a big pain in the ass, but we're going to try to have fun with this. So, uh, what causes same sex attraction? I have no idea who any of these people are. And um, I don't know. I'm sorry, but whatever. Like you did, you came here of your own free will. Hey guys, welcome to the show. Today I have a very special guest, Dr. Joseph Nicolosi Jr. And we are going to talk about why a boy develops same-sex attraction why a young boy developed well, the host here setting set my gaydar off a little bit homosexual attractions and it's fat it's fat this is going to be a fascinating discussion Man, i was i thought he was going to say it's fabulous uh because i have been reading his father's book dr joseph nicolosi senior called shame and attachment loss and this book blew my mind everything he says in this book i was just like whoa this is exactly like hey girl my childhood was like and i just want to say up front ultimately i believe that developing homosexual attractions is ultimately a spiritual thing what because of the fall because of the, because of the corruption these people yell out oh my god during sex uh and of sin so I think that's ultimately the issue, but we can also learn a lot from just observation uh, and look at family dynamics and see, you know, what are the factors that 
that propel this forward. And so Dr. J Joseph Nicolosi Jr. is a licensed clinical psychologist, author, researcher, and clinical director at the Breakthrough Clinic in Southern California. Like in Orange County, Riverside? What is likely the largest clinic in the world that specializes in helping men with unwanted same-sex attractions. Oh no, he's got a fucking conversion therapist on. So there was this episode, if anybody's ever watched Boston Legal, where one of the judges, he was like obviously totally gay, like on the show, went to them to say that he he went to them to sue like some somebody, some um some, some conversion therapy people because they didn't ungay him. But he said, he's like, I have a sad. And that means same sex attraction disorder. <laughs> Fucking top tier episode of that show. So please welcome Joseph Nicolosi Jr. Thank you, Becky. I'm grateful to be here on your show. Uh, I know a lot of people talk about sexuality on your show from a religious standpoint. So I feel grateful that we can be here together and I can bring a different perspective mm. perspective. And I don't think these perspectives have to compete with one another. I think they could actually enhance Getting big zoom date vibes off of this already. So I'm, and by uh, the way, you are a, a Christian, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. I am. Yes. So, and so tell us before we get into shame and attachment loss, which <laughs> as, as I said, in the intro blew my mind. Um, tell us a little bit about your dad and why he got into this field in the first place and then why you took over the mantle um, after he passed away. So my father got started in this field because he was a Catholic. So he started a Catholic psychotherapy clinic and many men who would come to him had unwanted same sex attractions and he didn't know how to help these people. He, um, <laughs> here's how you help them. You, Hey friend, you're gay and it's fine. And he began by making two observations. The first observation he made was that men who came in to see him, who right off the bat appeared guarded, ill at ease, they had kind of a defensive posture, they come into the clinic, uh, hi, would, would you like me to sit there? Is that, should I say, okay, is that okay? You know, they had like a stance, they had a, 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 um, a posture toward him. And he was able to tell right away that the men who <laughs> Wait. demonstrated that posture were much- No, like if I go to the doctor, like, if I go to like a, a psychotherapist or somebody like even the first time, like I don't, I see them a couple times a year. Um, I still go to a therapist They're in Campbell though. It's a long trip for me. Uh, going to be a long trip for me soon. The first time I went in, I walked in and she opened the door for me and I was like, Oh, where do you want me to sit? Where should I sit? Cause I don't, I don't know where the fuck I was supposed to sit. <laughs> like to report having same sex attractions versus the other guy who just walks in and thoughtlessly plops down on the couch and just starts unloading about his life that was less likely to be a man who had same sex attractions so the first observation was that these men were more likely to have a guarded posture toward him um which he um because they called... there's a lot going on here already i have to assume that they had a guarded posture towards him because they knew this guy's opinion about homosexuality we're trying to like, um, we're trying to, as you might say, a uh, fucking tap dance around it. <laughs> they or maybe they just tap danced. Or men in general. Mm -hmm. And the second observation he made was that upon listening to these men, he began realizing that they were all describing the same family pattern. And so he started with those two observations. He had no training from his graduate school about what what leads to the development of homosexuality can sexuality change and so he had sexuality that's it's fucking well who cares we don't i don't why am i gay fucking who does like i've spent a whole lot of time thinking about it his own research he went into the psychological literature and eventually he began discovering an entire body of literature about this topic that was being covered over by the psychological establishment so he means like stuff from like dsm3 maybe dsm4 pro probably more like dsm3 like stuff that has been <clears throat> stuff that is outdated and has been shown like to most likely not be true and is not in dsm5 if i'm not mistaken dsm6 is coming soon too might be interesting to see uh if if um gender dysphoria is uh, removed from the, the dsm as like a a, a problem or a, a psychological illness i sure hope it is and then, uh, so, and then why did you decide to take this on as, as well? 
On a personal level, I believe that everybody should have the freedom to pick their own therapy goals. And I see people with traditional values who are being underserved. Their values are not being taken seriously. <clears throat> These people can go into. I'm. I'm in so, California. So this this guy is gonna get this guy's this guy's uh, fucking gonna get sued. Somebody he's gonna fuck some shit's gonna happen, and this guy's gonna get sued. California here. People will come into a psychotherapist and say that they're having conflict about their sexuality and the therapist will affirm them in that a direction that is L, G, B, T, Q, I, A, plus, go on and on. But if the same person says, hey, I want to move toward having a monogamous, traditional, heterosexual life, these clients are being told that they're just suppressing who they really are. And I think that's an injustice. It frustrates me. I think it, it gives me a pass. I don't, this topic. <clears throat> I'm not uh, sure that that's like what a good therapist would say. I think a good therapist in this case, I would assume would dig into why this person feels shame about being gay. That would be, I would assume the focus of proper therapy. Be like, let's talk a little bit about the shame and stigma. Can you, can we, can you say more about why you don't want to be gay like this is they're not going to be like sorry buddy you're gay that'll be five hundred dollars <laughs> i think a great disservice is being done to these people and they're not being told the truth they're not being told that sexuality can change um and i think Sexu i mean uh, it does people <laughs> people the things people want sexually do change but it's more like around the margins for most people or people come out late in life, but they were probably felt that way their whole life or at least since puberty, their sexuality didn't change, but he wants the car to go the other way. Like you tap dance in and you fucking, and you fucking square dance out, you know, in your, in shame and attachment loss, uh, the gay affirmative therapists see the shame as internalized homophobia. Yes. Versus what you see. So can you just kind of describe what that means, internalized homophobia? Yes, yes. I don't even, I think it could be, it might not. Okay, so this is probably an oversimplification too. For some people, sure, they've absorbed a, a negative views of homosexuality from society around them. But what if the homophobia is external and they don't want to deal with it? Like, Internalized homophobia is the is the concept that uh, if an individual feels shame about his homosexuality, if he has if he feels elevated shame in general, and he deals with same sex attractions, it's probably his internalized homophobia. It's the negative attitudes, the the um, heteronormative, heterosexist views of society that that he has internalized, and that is the only reason why he. Ooh, notice how this is all about gay men. I bet these people have. Somebody comes up, some uh, lady comes up and goes, oh, you know what I like? I like licking pussy. And they go, fuck yeah, you do. <laughs> Except his homosexuality. If he can just overcome that, he will be just as happy and healthy as anybody else. That's the concept. Right. And so your, your approach, obviously, is in stark contrast to that. Yeah, so my father's approach and the one in, in shame and attachment loss, I want to be precise about this this model that my father developed for over 30-something years. So the basic model is this. As kids grow up, they go through different developmental stages. So uh, uh, a seven-year-old and a one-year-old are going through different things. No shit. Kids grow, Dude, a fucking 27-year-old and a fucking 37-year-old are probably going through different things. I'm fucking genius developmental stages and the developmental stage stages are the same for boys and girls up until about two and a half years of age give or take a few months this is what's called the gender identity phase of development this is the first time that a boy has an additional developmental task that the girl doesn't have and that is to disidentify from the mother and to identify with the father wait what what the what the, what the what excuse you What? And in some homes, that task is a lot harder for the boy. And according to the, the theory, according to the model, based on a thousand men that my that my father treated, or more than a thousand. See, but that's probably and it's it's not always good to like use yourself as an example. But as an example of this, like 
I was always like me and my dad were always homies from very young. We were, I don't, as long as I can remember, we were always going out doing things like mom would always take me to lunch or whatever. Mom, me and mom like to go have lunch. That's or dinner. If, 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 like dad's not around or whatever. But when I was like, from the time I was really young, I just always remember being in the car with like my, my dad was so involved in everything I was doing from the very beginning. There are more pictures of me in the photo albums from me being a baby with my pops than with my mom. Uh, and mind you, this is a sample set of one and I'm kind of a weird gay, but this is bullshit. This is all, this is that, oh, this is that, oh, overbearing mother. This is that overbearing mother turns you into a homo bullshit. When the father is more d distant or detached, critical, and the mother is more high anxiety, over-involved and sometimes intrusive, and we have a boy who's more temperamental. You're talking about my life. <laughs> you're, you're well, 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 Beckett. Beckett, we have some thoughts about you, Beckett. That's, I'm just saying that's a nice shirt. That's all I'm saying about Beckett. That's a nice shirt. My childhood. But go ahead. Okay, okay. So it's, it's hitting home for you. So yeah. distant detached father, boy who's temperamentally sensitive. Wait, um, is Beckett for... Is Beckett Cook, like, ex-gay? I don't know anything about this guy put those factors together and that's going to make it a lot harder for the boy at that particular developmental stage. Now, add you can add to it other factors as well. If there's a bullying older brother, um, sometimes there can be in the lives of these boys, there's sexual abuse, which can make it even more confusing for the boy and make it harder for him to... There's, there's, no, there's no evidence that being abused by a man or a woman will, will turn you toward or against uh, men or women in adulthood. There's no evidence of this. Experience himself as a guy among guys. So as these developmental patterns interfere with this boy's uh, uh, stage of development here, what that means is the boy will try to reach out to the father, but if the father doesn't reciprocate, the boy experiences a hurt. My father called it a narcissistic hurt because the boy at two takes it personally. Oh, there must be something about me that's unworthy in mm. a gender sense. And so he experiences this hurt. He retreats back to the mother and doesn't make that gender identity shift. And the consequence- I'm sorry, what, no, no, of <clears throat> this is also, this is also like, your who you're attracted to isn't gender like even the fucking gender critical people agree with me that who you're attracted to isn't your gender that's who you're attracted to the of what happens in that stage has it's, it's an impact that is felt in the other developmental stages so as this boy gets older Oftentimes, girls are his closest friends. He knows them like the back of his hand. But boys are a mystery. Boys are exciting. Boys are intriguing. There's an exotic quality to boys. What? It's like half of the people. Nothing exotic about it. He sees this, the, this boy in this situation will see other boys as... Um, uh, a little bit uh, scary sometimes. These mm -hmm. guys are roughhousing and they're and they're wrestling. And this boy oftentimes. <clears throat> so this is this is uh, he's sort of describing a, <clears throat> like a, a meek or possibly like introverted child, right? A child who likes to draw, a child who likes to um, paint. Like would rather like he's describing an introvert. He's not. This has nothing to do with whether or not you're gay. Maybe, maybe the kid just doesn't like to roughhouse. He's like, I don't know. It looks like, looks like some of those people get hurt. Uh, feeling like he can fit in. And the consequence, the cumulative consequences of this is that this boy experiences this hurt. He feels insecure in his sense of maleness. And he la fundamentally lacks the male attention, affection, and approval that his other male peers got. And those unmet needs because... But you don't know that. Wait, what the fuck? Now you're talking about, you're talking about an imaginary kid. And then outside of that imaginary kid are like imaginary other boys. And I suppose all these other boys have like really good and attentive fathers, imaginary boys. But the, the, the boy you're talking about who doesn't want to go fucking roughhouse at lunch and would rather like sit at a table with other kids and draw or something like what the fuck? is typically in early adolescence.
And that's where we start to see, according to the model, this, this development of same-sex attractions. Yeah, and let's talk about the concept of the kitchen window boy, because uh, that really struck me that, because when I was a child... What the fuck is a kitchen window boy? My five brothers were out playing football in the yard. I was in the kitchen always with my mother and probably my mother's girlfriends. And I, it was like this dynamic of, I would lo look outside and just kind of want that, but feel like I couldn't attain that. And I felt safer or more, I just felt more comfortable and at ease with women and with my mom. So what, talk about the kitchen window boy. Yeah, the kitchen window boy, he's going, he's looking out and seeing other boys playing on the street and he's there with, with mom and his sisters and they're braiding each other's hair and this kid's like looking out the window. It's like, this looks like a whole different world. It feels alien to me. And the mm -hmm. boy wants to connect. But does, fellas, you know, fellas, is it, is it gay to braid your sister's hair or her? <laughs> fellas, is it gay to be close to your sister? How to, and it just feels like an impasse. Yeah, and uh, in same, shame and attachment laws. Yeah, me and my sister uh, were says, thick as thieves for a while. I'm five years older than her, so it took a while. But by the time like she was maybe 17 and I was, what, 22 by right about then, we were thick as thieves for fucking 10 years. Among same-sex attracted men, we often see a temperament that is sensitive, emotional, relational, and more aesthetically oriented than the gender typical male um why so so you're just like talking about an empathetic boy you're talking about a caring kind boy i want to say this contributes to the boys often reported feeling of discomfort around other males including their fathers so talk about that a little bit why how does this aesthetically oriented uh thing this component get how does that happen the other thing that might be playing out and it's so much different now right but i think these guys at least the guy on the right i think is in like my age cohort and <clears throat> i mean it was different for me but the friends of mine who when they came out they were definitely more nervous about their telling their dad than their mom just because they i think people kind of knew that women in like m generally were going to be less judgmental of like gay men like in the 90s or whatever when people in my generation came of age late 80s early 90s but that doesn't matter. Like nowadays, fucking like when I came out, I told my parents I was gay and they were like, yeah, we know. I was like, oh, that was, that was easy. <laughs> True. Like I, when I was young, I would notice things. I would notice aesthetic thing. I and mean, that's why I was a production designer. And it's like, but I would notice these things. I would let this guy plan my wedding, but he wouldn't plan my wedding because it's a gay wedding and he would cry because he's never going to get gay married uh aesthetically that none of my siblings would notice or my parents would notice i i was always kind of like i don't know it was like this weird kind of superpower <laughs> i had but what what is that about so there may be two components no you just explained it that you ended up being a designer you have an eye for design it's something that you've always been interested fellas fellas is it gay to notice that you're in a nice restaurant? <laughs> is it gay to walk into the lobby of a hotel and be like, fuck, this is a nice place, isn't it? This is of the component that you just described. One is, some of this is based in genetics. Temperament does appear to have some genetic basis. Some kids just are born with a more um, rambunctious, resilient stance toward the outside world, and others are more sensitive. So part of it could be genetic. The other part of it- Is it gay to be sensitive now? To the early relationship with the mother. So we're gonna really go into some sensitive territory here, Becca. So uh, we already have, but we're gonna go even further into that. So the sensitive temperament, the, um, what set the stage for that may have been the early relationship with the mother. And I mentioned the relationship with the but father. What, what, but this is so crazy. This is so, what if your, what if your dad was the one who modeled sensitivity and like somebody in chat said, Oh, you know, my dad was, um, I don't remember the wording, but it was like more, more affectionate, more, more like in touch with uh, the, my emotions or the emotions of the kids. And mom was more practical. Not that you, you know, in a situation like that, maybe, maybe mom being more practical, maybe sometimes it's time to go to mom when you got a problem. 
clients have mothers who are higher anxiety and some of them can relate to the boy in a more narcissistic oh this is all this is some bitches be having drama shit too here right and some of these mothers felt themselves during that early phase of development the first few years of the boy's life sometimes it's because they felt separated from their their husbands um, or there were other conflicts going on but the mothers looked toward those boys and, and and in their high anxiety and and sometimes conditional ways um, they would their mode of relating to the boy would sabotage the boy's individuation his I'm sorry and being an, another his own person so I can give you fellas is it gay for your mom to care about you is it gay for your mom to want to hang out with you like maybe mom it's stay-at-home mom or maybe mom works part time for a while or whatever. Fellas, does it does it make you gay if mom hangs out with you and, and dad works maybe a little bit of overtime? Give you an example of a client who I saw uh, yesterday. Or wait a minute, don't aren't these aren't these probably the same people that think that the the mom should stay home and take care of the kids? This is gonna this this gets this all gets like incredibly complicated. And by complicated, I mean this is all fucking stupid. And when this man, he's now like a 40 year old man, married and has kids, but does have some same sex attractions. When he would attempt oh, individual. Um, I think if he's married, loves his wife, has kids, but some, sometimes is attracted to men, I think we call that bisexual or <clears throat> maybe heteroflexible if it's just occasionally and it's not like a super strong drive his mother and go out and and roughhouse or or sometimes just say no and be his own little individual um in his relationship with his mother the mother would really put the brakes on that when the boy would try to assert an opinion the mother would say are you sure are you really sure you want to do that and it would mm -hmm. no that's a that's a good that's good parenting actually that's would be good for a therapist too if you're like hey i think i'm going to handle it some the situation this way and the therapist like you sure can you, you can we maybe think of some other ways that you could handle the situation? Might there be other solutions? Might there be better solutions? That what he just described is like good parenting. Instead of telling a kid, "Oh, that's dumb," or whatever, you 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 say, "Hey, you know, do you think that's a good idea? Are you sure?" Undermine the boy's sense of being able to make his own choices, and so we we put focus on the father at age two. But going back even earlier, there are some relational dynamics with the mother which can set the stage for that temperamental sensitivity in the boy. Yeah, and um, I think I I think I read this in this book. I can't remember where, but um, well, that's because you shouldn't read while you're checking your grinder. When the boy, a, a one-year-old, starts to learn to walk and realizes he can be separated from the mother, if the mother somehow intrudes on that separation and is like, oh, no, 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 be careful, or oh, watch that, yes. like, that's really bad for yes. the child, right? Yes. It, so, so for a boy who doesn't have that temperamental sensitivity, it may not have the same impact on him. But for the boy who is more sensitive, yeah, the mother's heightened anxiety. Don't get dirty. Don't play with that boy. You're going to get hurt. No, you can't do that. It gives him a sense of like uh, of heightened fearfulness. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he has an, an, a, um, a hypervigilance. The, back to the book, it says some children, because I wanted to ask about how do we know this isn't fully genetic or fully well, we don't. We don't, but I think it doesn't matter because being gay is, I don't know, it's been fun for me. You know, the other gays listening to this, you have, enjoy being gay. <laughs> if you don't, I guess you can go to this guy on the left. Biological, it could be a hormonal in utero, yes. uh, but it says some children may indeed have a biological predisposition to homosexuality, but predisposition is not the same as predetermination. That's Explain. Right. That's right. So a temperamental sensitivity could be genetically based, and that's true. But that oh, I can't say what I was going to say. Like I'm going to go on, I'm going to go on Twitter and call this guy a name that I can't say on Twitch. I mean, it's a gay gene where it's de a determining factor. Like no, no, but that's, but that's, that's the thing. And like, the, I think people talked about it that way for a while. And I think, especially with the rise of the so-called intellectual dark web, and now everybody's a fucking scientist, people who 
<clears throat> actually study this aren't going to tell you that there's just one gene that switches one way or the other and it turns you into homo or whatever. <clears throat> if it's genetic or maybe if it's born in, maybe because that's a better way or it's kind of built in that you're going to be a tra I don't fucking know. I feel like it's fucking, I feel like the only time that this matters, like, like, is, and the only time that therapy would be appropriate is if you're attracted to minors. I think that's something you can go work on. How I have to be. That wouldn't make any sense in terms of genetics for several reasons. Number one, we know that it's not completely genetic because of twin studies. So if it were genetic, then all identical twins, where they have the exact same genes, they would all be in pairs, both heterosexual or both homosexual. And we see um, it is not a perfect rate of concordance. So many times we'll see a, a gay identified twin and a heterosexual twin. So it can't simply be genetics. Um, there What's the have, what is the rate of concordance? Well, the rate used to be understood to be roughly 50-50. So if there's a if if one had same sex attraction, there's a fifty percent chance the other. So one I don't like this um, <clears throat> the way that they're trying to clinicalize this too. Has same sex attraction? It's like saying has pneumonia. Friend, you got two twins and one of them's gay. I don't know. Fucking who fucking knows? Pray about it fucking weirdo would be heterosexual but the newer data that's using large yeah, like somebody said in chat and i was thinking that too and i don't know for sure but i don't think even identical twins i don't think they're genetically identical i'm not sure i'm not sure actually saying that the concordance rate is actually even less so they're more discordant and so the newer studies um which as we are doing the larger population studies, which is actually coming more out of the Netherlands, um, we're starting to have to really revise it. So right now, I don't think we have an exact number, but I think we're seeing that that 50% that figure is falling rapidly. Okay, let's, let's now look at the family dynamic of the mother, father, and son. So, oh, yo, friends, somebody just mentioned this. Can somebody send this to a friend of the show, Marcus Homozygote? I don't think I've ever seen him get like, like livid angry on stream and i have a feeling i have a feeling this one this one would do it i have a feeling our good friend a homozygote marcus uh would lose his goddamn mind if he watched this in the book it says the father the boy experiences his father as hostile emotionally detached or both although he may be highly competent in the business world he is seen by the boy as a non-salient in family life, failing to be both good and quote good enough and strong enough. Uh, which is which is interesting because that's that's what happened to me as a child. My father was, was fucking very mad man. competent and as a lawyer. He was very, very, very capable. Woke up at five in the morning. You know, my dad had eight kids. He support he was very, very competent. But are, I'm sorry, Beckett, are you the only one who used to be gay or whatever? A experience that that detachment from him just because and, and again, I don't I don't want to I want I don't want parents to feel like was this guy's know, apartment in the Castro them or I just want I want them to just see that they're these are really important observations about why a child develops same. I, I wish. After yeah. That's somebody in chat. Ducky in chat just said waking up at five isn't a sign of competence. Some people just like to get up early. If you go to bed at like nine, eight, eight thirty, 30, and you wake up at five and that's your routine, that's your routine. This doesn't make you more or less competent than someone who even goes to bed at five and wakes up at one or two. Like, book i was thinking you know i just wish my dad were still alive so i could so he could read this book and and we could have a conversation about dad because my dad never <laughs> he was such a man's man and so old school like he never Ooh, i bet his dad was gay that's why i was getting up at five in the morning i go to the gym <clears throat> you know the why gym he, i'm talking he about didn't understand why i turned out to be gay he didn't really get it so talk about that and how the father that kind of detachment from the father how 
where when does that start when do, when is a child supposed to attach to the father he said earlier at two and a half years old but i guarantee you i i'm just telling you oh i saw those pictures they're not ai some of them are fucking some of them are so old they got like sepia tone and shit more pictures of me with my dad than my mom i mean possibly double you're bringing up several good points. Let me just now that could just be that my mom liked to take pictures. She always takes more pictures of everything than my dad. But I mean, it's, it's so weird. This is all so weird. Thing that you said earlier. This is about naming, not blaming. We're not here to assign blame to people. And it's true that the, we're talking about constellations of factors. So it may not be the exact situation for every single person. There yeah. might be, you know, I can tell you a third of my clients were sexually abused when they were young and they can say, well, I hope they find, uh, I hope they find a better therapist that, but there was this particular day when this event occurred and I did not experience homosexual attractions before that day. After that day, things went in a different direction. Mm -hmm. So, but there, there are a variety but what of was, factors. Like what else was, and we're not here to, oh, this is anecdotal. Also, it's like, I know he's not naming the names of his patients and stuff, but I think it's generally frowned upon. To like use your own experience talking with your patients like in a like as a psychologist to like draw any conclusions about the world or to even talk about it this way to assign blame to anyone but there there can be other factors outside of the family like sexual abuse is another example or bullying can also be a compounding factor mm -hmm. so again going back to this is about naming not blaming no this is this is like i said earlier like i said earlier somebody in chat asked are these patients women and no they're very much focused on men and like men's sexuality friend this is not a cookie a perfect cookie cutter model we're speaking in generalities but to go back to your point about uh, your question about when is the boy supposed to bond with the father you could go to a daycare in manhattan um, you could, in upscale Manhattan, you can go to a tribe in Uganda, you are going to find boys um, around two and a half who get this surge of interest in gender. And they're going to be into, it shows up in different cultures, but in our culture, it's going to be Superman, Batman, Iron Man. The boy is often drawn to these larger than life male figures. And we see it again and again and again. And at that developmental stage, the boy is the the boy is trying to figure out, wait, there are two kinds of people in this world. And like, which one am I? And the girl is thinking this too at this developmental stage, but the boy has the additional uh, task of saying, well, I've been identified with my mother my whole life and, and I'm different. My body is different. I'm, I, I'm more like this other guy. Language adds to this because I'm being called he instead of she. So I guess I have to make a choice here. And so um, with language development and, and all this, it's, it's right around two and a half, give or take, I would say. Well, but wait a minute. If it has to do with language development, maybe, and I'm, I'm no fucking linguist. We'd have to get Steven Pinker here uh, or maybe like Dr. Green. Aren't like, don't these happen like concurrently? Like when you start forming, like when you start being able to speak, like not just like baby talk or single words, but when you actually start being able to speak, doesn't that also, <clears throat> doesn't that also happen around the time <clears throat> that you are able to like develop things like concepts of gender? I could be wrong here, but I think that these things, and they might, it might, inf they might be connected right that you are because you don't really have words for something or whatever you don't really have a concept of it i could be fucking wrong here but i think i, th I think i'm not so it's like no surprise that when somebody starts talking oh that'll also be the first time that they tell you that they noticed that there's a difference between mommy and daddy too because otherwise how the fuck are they going to tell you that they're going to fucking telepathy it to you Okay, and then the mother, it says, the mother's attentions are typically described by the son as over-involved, intrusive, possessive, and controlling. The relationship between them is particularly close. Yeah, but I have a feeling this guy is like fucking leading these people in that direction, asking them loaded questions, nudging them in this direction when he talks to them. I don't know. Oh, Oh, if I wasn't a public, like if, if I wasn't a public figure, I would make an appointment with this guy, like to see if he'd do like Zoom therapy with me.
the I wouldn't be able to record and publish it, but I just I talk about there's it. There's often a feeling of, you know, we're soulmates or confidants. She confi she confides her own emotional needs to the son as well as her chronic dissatisfaction with the father. Now again, this is exactly what happened to me. And in the on the next page, Beckett, you're just gay. Look at that furniture. As you talk about, you know, this the um the son, he his equilibrium, he he maintains his equilibrium by offering her the sensitive and relational son who serves as a spousal surrogate. And my I, it's interesting because I, my, you know, childhood and my, you know, so this is okay. So <clears throat> this is also baked into this is that the mom stays home with the kid, right? So I could imagine that until you really understand why, why dad's gone all day, you might be more like identified with mom. But then like, again, right around the time when you start to develop language, I mean, yeah, when you start to develop language and you start being able to talk and possibly as you start being able to talk, you're able to like understand what other people are saying in like a, in, like a more fundamental or like, um, like more, uh, cohesive way. Now you'll be like, Oh, dad goes to work because we need money. And then maybe you like, now you get it. This is stupid. We don't even need like a psychologist to, to debunk this. Like you just need to think about like in their view of the world, mind you, like what's going on during these times. In, in college, I, in my view of the world, fucking, I feel, I feel bad that me being born stopped my mom from working for a while. And even beyond that, I felt like I was my mother's surrogate husband because because you know, some he, therapist fucking led you down that fucking path wasn't he didn't give her a, the attention she wanted or the whatever needs weren't satisfied with her she turned to me to to, to fill those needs at two i hope not friendo that's weird and i don't mean like that she was like that anything like untoward was going on or whatever, like that there was any sexual abuse, but just like <clears throat> the, the idea that a, a person in a stable relationship, if they're, if maybe they're staying at home with the kids, their partners at work. So they're going to like try to get their emotional needs met by a fucking two year old. This is, this is stupid. This is one of the dumbest fucking things we've ever watched. And um, so talk about that for a second, because that's so it's just so true. And I I I mean, I literally for my entire life, I felt like my mother's happiness was dependent upon me. That right there is referred to as there's a phrase as the liability of specialness, right? Liability of specialness on one hand. I have this special relationship that my siblings don't have with mom. And in a certain extent that even my own father doesn't have with mom. This feels great. This feels like a great person. No, I think it's pretty healthy actually, as it that to this day at 47 years old, my relationship with my mother is different than my sister's relationship with my mother. And it is different than my father's relationship with my mother, because I have a, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to tell you that the four of us are all different people. And are going to interact with each other in a different way. At the same time, there's a liability to that specialness because when the mother is sad, when the mother is hurt, the boy feels like it's incumbent upon him to be her listening ear, to cheer her up. And that places a burden on the boy. And this is a great. So, illustration. so from a very young age, if you're in tune to the fact that you, you that your mom is upset about something and you feel the need to comfort your mom, you know, in whatever way you can, maybe at two or three years old, you're not really quite sure what to do. So you just go like, I don't know, sit with your, hug your mom, you know, whatever you do, uh, gay. <laughs> Homo city, everybody of something very politically incorrect, but this is an illustration of what we, when my father talked about the narcissistic dynamic with the mother and the son, it's not to say that the mother is a narcissist. It's to say that unconsciously the mother is looking to that young boy at that developmental period for needs that 
for to meet some of her own needs and that places that burden on the boy and we have the liability of special I'm sorry what the fuck else is your family for like what the fuck yeah you're you're able to the family helps you meet your emotional needs you know different ways it gets a young child obviously still like if you're ha if you're having a fucking bad day and you you break down and start crying or whatever and if your fucking little four-year-old comes up and oh mommy i love you it'll it's gonna be okay or whatever i don't know what a four-year-old might say but then like hugs you or like you know lays his head on your lap or whatever yeah you're gonna that's gonna be comforting yes that's another human being even if it's a fucking four-year-old that cares about you and cares about your well-being this is he's what he's describing up uh, it's good that's a good thing happens at that early age but that liability of specialness has an effect much later on as that boy becomes a man because when that boy starts to feel pressure from society to move toward heterosexuality if if that boy is anything like the 500 clients i've personally treated when that boy starts to go into dating, he has a propensity to take too much responsibility for the woman's needs. And it feels like just too much. And he wants to retract himself from her. And dating feels like it just Brent, it feels Brent, like a burden. Brent, if, and many Brent, you're, you're, uh, 500 clients came to you to ungay themselves. Mine's going to go like 480 of them are just gay. Clients say, I can't understand why my other male peers are so excited about dating. For me, it feels like a drain. And it is hard. Well, yeah, because yeah, 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 you might not, some people might not even understand it yet. Because uh, people start like dating some, some kids like eight, nine, they have a girlfriend. They don't really have a girlfriend. Right. But, and if, if you're gay, you, you're not quite sure even what that means when you're young. Yeah. You're not going to be like super enthused about it because you're not sure what the fuck is going on. Them to relate to the woman in an intimate context while simultaneously feeling grounded in their sense of masculine identity because they mm. slip back into that mode and it's like this isn't pleasurable this isn't enjoyable and it goes back to that early liability of specialness dynamic yes um no this is a little repetitive but it's important because i want to drive this home um it says my mother uh, the mother invests herself in this particular son whom she can control and mold fortunately fortunately she has none of the objectionable aspects of her husband but in her possessive love she engulfs him when the couple argues the son sides with the mother and identifies with her hurt and anger which is i'm yeah. sure my parents fought but they kept it away from me and my sister i think i only saw my parents fight like a couple times they kept it away from us and it wasn't like i don't think that there was any like shit going they're still together for fuck's sake they're old like old old everybody fucking nobody gets along 100 percent of the time what happened to me you know i i resented my father my whole life in a, in a certain way because my mother would complain about him so much that i i felt like so if I had to take a guess as what's going on here with Beckett Cook, and I'm just guessing, uh, Beckett Cook's uh, dad was a lawyer. It sounds like he was at least emotionally abusive of uh, Beckett's mother and possibly emotionally abusive of Beckett. Now, I'm just guessing here based on the context we have. And, and as such, Beckett and his mom became close. And I think the fact that Beckett, I'm sorry, used to be gay i think i'm guessing that he's ex-gay used to be gay you know i used to be a <laughs> i used to flip laptops on ebay sometimes things change uh, <laughs> now i'm just guessing based on the context here or dad maybe wasn't even abusive but was like emotionally unavailable and, and mom had a bit of a rough time with that and uh and but beckett i think used to having been gay let's not get it twisted here folks used to having used to been gay which i think he's ex, supposedly ex-gay based on the context here that was all because of his dad being distant from his mom this is fucking this is this is fucking crazy i, I would always side with my mother and so i would i would have this kind of anger towards my father and and she inadvertently my mother turned me against my father in a certain way is that common and i like how you said inadvertent yeah it was not her intention 
many of these mothers. But wait a minute, isn't there like a? I'm sorry. There's. I'm guessing there's a correlation between having an abusive parent or just a cold and distant parent who didn't give a fuck about you, or if they do, they don't know how to show it, <clears throat> and then maybe thinking that they're ashamed of you because you're gay, and then you then modeling the shame that you that you think you see in your parents or in one of your, both of your parents, and then wanting to go to this guy on the left, Joseph Nicolosi's fucking weird conversion therapy fucking bullshit. I do. In fact, if anything, the mother feels like it's her job to be a go-between, between the sensitive son and the father who has his own stuff. And the mothers, the mothers are typically attuned. They're seeing the dynamic, and so they feel like they have to be the go-between, where they go to the father and say, look, he's really sick, can you talk to him about this? Or they go to the son and say, well, try again with your father. And but again, that's good parenting. Wait, no, hey, I know you had a, I know, honey, I know you had a long day, but, um, you know, Mr. Balls. I'm very upset about something and i don't know i tried to talk to him you want to want to go want to go talk to him i know you had a long day but like i need some help a good parenting actually a lot of the things that they're that they're describing some of the things they're describing here probably didn't happen but then some of the things they're describing are like good parenting like that's good parenting i tried to talk to him um he still seems very upset i don't know maybe if you want to try talking to him what ends up happening is Great. inadvertently that can drive a wedge between father and and son. Yeah, I but that that doesn't drive. No, no, no. That no, no, the thing you just described doesn't drive a wedge between the father and the son because the mom was like, "Hey, could you having a bad day? Could you go, I know. Oh, you look stressed, but check this out. I we need. I need some help. You know, um, Mr. Balls is very upset. Uh, for people listening on the podcast, there's someone in my chat uh, named Monsieur Balls. That's who I just picked a name in the chat. I mean, my whole life, just whenever I needed something like money or whatever, I would never go directly to my father. It was always my mother was the go between. I would I would ask her. She would go to him. He would tell her and she would come back to me. I would never ask my father directly for money. Uh, so that's 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 very true. Now, the father son relationship, it says. Uh, our, co our clients commonly say, quote, I never knew my father minimal or non-existent their relationship is characterized by poor communication and lack of openness and trust the father is seen by the boy as distant or critical father and son almost never speak about meaningful issues and personal disclosure is a yeah yeah so this is like this is like i don't think i think this guy's got the car going the other way he's got the car going the wrong way i think he's just and and this isn't going to be true for all this other guy's clients or whatever, but yeah, if you're, if you, if one of your parents is distant, doesn't pay any attention to you or whatever, and possibly has indicated to you that maybe they're homophobic or that they're disappointed or, you know, when you got a, you know, when you first like started dating, you know, another, another a boy or whatever, or like in high school, you started, you found a, another gay guy and you started dating and mom was like super interested. And dad was just like, all right, well, yeah, like that's, that's kind of, that, it's going to fuck with you, but it, ah, oh, this is so crazy, but it's not going to fuck with you and make you more gay. It's going to fuck with you. And you're going to end up at this guy's fucking gay conversion therapy bullshit because like you have a whole bunch of fucking shit around, like whether or not your parent, whether or not one or more, one or maybe even both of your parents accept you for who you are. And that, that can fuck somebody up. It doesn't fuck everybody up that that happens to, but that can fuck somebody up. But then the problem is you go to Joseph N Nicolosi Jr. and he fucks you up some more. Uh, and this is, again, this is true in my case. Um, my father, and my love, my father is amazing. He was great. And he's in heaven now. He's thrilled. <laughs> he was a great dad. And thrilled. Great. Your dad's in heaven and he's thrilled. All right, dude. In terms of this dynamic, um, I, n I never felt like I could talk to him about anything. I mean, when we, when we would, uh, our conversations were, he would come home from work and say, Hey Beck. And I would say, Hey dad. And that was it. And then I'd like go to my bedroom and hide, <laughs> not hide, but I would just kind of, I never ever felt comfortable 
just alone with my father or in the car with my father alone. I never felt comfortable. It was like, God, some of my best memories are me alone with one of my parents, especially if we had to drive somewhere far. <laughs> but, ah, oh man, I like my view on this is just so skewed because my parents are just such absolutely good people, like inherently good people. My whole life, even until he passed away, like in 2016 or 2015. So, do you have any comment on that? I have a few comments on it. Um, and permit me, if you will, to get a little nerdy here for two minutes. Okay, a little get detail. nerdy. Okay, let's get nerdy. This as long as you let Beckett Hook show you his dance moves. This is really important. There are many people. At first, I was afraid. I was petrified. LGBT researchers, LGBT clinicians who would say, okay, look, we know from the psychological literature that men who are gay identified are much more likely to report estrangement in their relationship with their fathers. And we know this from the psychological literature, overwhelmingly. But what they would say- Wait, wait, wait but what's the cause and what's the effect? We also know from polling that women were out ahead of men as a group on acceptance of, of homosexuality especially of men being homosexual. So if you were a little fruity and maybe, maybe your dad was less likely to be accepting of that and mom was less likely to care, then yeah, you're going to be way closer to your mom, but that's not your, that's not because you're a homo. That's because your dad is a homophobe. Maybe not even a homophobe, maybe just, you know, it, it it took some people some time, right? Like a lot of people, like it didn't go from <clears throat> something like in the, like in the year 2000, and I'm just pulling numbers out of my ass here, but it didn't go from like 35% of people <clears throat> or whatever in, in 2000 <clears throat> to like the overwhelming majority of people by 2016 being in favor of gay marriage without a lot of motherfuckers changing their mind because times were changing. Okay. It's not because the father did anything uh, that w would have contributed to the boy's homosexuality. The boy was born gay. He was effeminate from the beginning. And but that gay doesn't mean effeminate. There's the other thing is <clears throat> we, and this is getting better too. Thankfully, a lot of the, a lot of the research on gay people like oversampled for people who, and you're going to have to excuse my language here for people who would, might have been called like a flamer or whatever. They were flaming gay, like Richard Simmons, right? A lot of the stuff was based on Richard Simmons, not on Rock Hudson. Was as the father, because of his own internalized homophobia, he consciously or unconsciously recognize the effeminacy in his son and he retracted he pulled back from mm -hmm. the son and that is why there's in other words what they're saying is there is no correlation there's no causation only correlation when we look at the boy's gay identity and the estrangement from the father they're just it's, it's well no the father's reaction <clears throat> it's to the son. and it, it's it's more that more research is needed again because like we're again, we're just past the point where like most people are in America, for example, are like totally chill with gay, even most Republicans now. So like, it's going to take a while for like the bodies of research to catch up. And as more people, more, I don't know, people who you might not immediately figure out are gay start, or keep coming out. This is so, this is so fucked up. So that's one perspective. There's the other perspective. And from that perspective, no, the, the, the distant critical relationship with the father did contribute to the boy's same sex attractions in two important ways. Number one is because of the, of the lack of security in that relationship, the boy did not feel a sense of strength in his masculine identity. He didn't feel secure in it. The second impact on the boy is that the boy is lacking the male attention, male affection, and male approval that he longs for, the boy longs for, and those needs kind of get buried underground and then come back up in a sexualized form. But yeah. wait a minute. Hold on. Wait, 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 wait. Aren't there a lot of straight men? Does this guy, does this guy ever talk to any straight men? 
or mostly straight men because I felt estranged from my father in my formative years. That That's not just a gay thing. So we have these two competing theories here. It's like and the chicken or the egg. Which came the first? The chicken or the egg. Thank <laughs> you. So how do we figure out, and, and this debate has been going on for, for easily 50 years, how do we resolve what the relationship is here between these and w which view better explains the data so there was what data are you looking at clinician named how old is the data Gold how was it collected what were the biases of the culture and the people collecting the data at the time on exploring whether or not we can find an answer to this question and she did this her dissertation on it and then she also did an article on it which i have right here the the relationship between an article so not a not a, an article confidence. motherfucker i write articles at least one a year she wrote an article did he print out a blog is this is this from substack fathers of gay sons anybody can go online and look this up if they want to do a deep dive but i'm going to summarize it so so in her research, Golden measured seven. So the, I, they do this. <clears throat> they do this all the time. This is not. This is a, a an, This is an intellectual Dollar Tree thing that we notice. Someone will treat. We'll just call it a Substack article or a Medium article or a post on a blog as if it's a scientific paper because the person writing it has some kind of credential. The difference is, though, uh, your blog is self-published. Nobody gets to decide whether or not your article gets published and the only form of peer review really is going to be the comments under it or if it gets popular enough other people in that field may be uh, critiquing commenting on it but it's not formalized like the like publishing a paper in a journal and so those aren't the same thing there's of gay identified men with three well-established psychological measures and what she found was that these fathers were shown to exhibit what she called indirect, non-nurturing, or low engagement types of father involvement activities. But there's also like, there's also just a whole lot of fucking baggage for fathers too, that a lot of fathers are breaking out of now. Like the dads I know don't do this shit, but like mom and daughter, it was culturally acceptable for them to be physically close to hug a lot in public that kind of thing and it was sort of looked down on at least like for parents like in my parents generation and I, my dad wasn't like very physically affectionate with uh, either of us it just doesn't but in public he also wasn't likely to like kiss my mother and stuff i just don't think that was he wasn't that's just not in his nature but there was a lot of stigma around that and i don't know where it came from because you look at old photos and fathers and sons are you have tons of photos of fathers and sons being affectionate. And if you look at other cultures too, like outside of America, especially like Southern Europe, um, South America, and uh, even the middle, the Middle East to some extent, the fathers are affectionate with with their with their sons, with their gay sons, rather than direct nurturing and high. The problem, yeah, I think the problem with this is he has. There's no, and I don't want to. First of all, what he's doing isn't really research, right? It's hundreds of anecdotes of people that he tried to ungay um but there's no group of people that he's able to compare this with like does he have also 500 straight clients who maybe feel a, or many of them feel estranged from one or more of their one or both of their parents like this is this there's no this is like a coin but it only has a heads and on the other side is just a fucking blank piece of metal and now many of the the gay theorists would say well that's well, we know that it's because of his the father's internalized homophobia but she went even further into it and she looked at the fathers of gay men and looked at their relationships with their fathers because how a man fathers is often easily predicted by his own relationship with his own father yeah these things have inertia that's Study correct yeah confirmed that those fathers who demonstrated the lower levels of engagement with their young sons they also reported receiving less involvement from their own fathers in their childhood so in other yeah no shit the results indicated that the father yeah, somebody in chat we, we already brought this up avalon and babylon in chat what about the fathers of lesbians these people are like i don't care 
that make me uncomfortable. Involvement with their own fathers was, in fact, a predictor of how those men fathered their gay identified sons. And this indicates that the parenting patterns that we're, we're talking about today with the, with the fathers of gay identified sons, those were patterns that those fathers experienced in their own childhoods with their own fathers. Now, a person may say, well, wait a second, but why didn't those fathers end up having a gay identity? And there were several, probably several factors. Number one is those fathers had a different temperament, okay, than the sons. Some of those fathers were uh, gay or bisexual, sir. The farther back you go into history, the less acceptable it was, especially in American society. Some of those fathers were gay or bisexual. They have to have been. They're gay identified I, sons. I'm They're not saying a majority. We, we're, 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 you know, I don't know what the numbers are. We used to say one in 10, and I don't know what the, what the research is now, but. Um, there may not have been sexual abuse. Their relationships with their older brothers could have been different. And mm -hmm. so this goes back to the idea of a, of, a, of a constellation of factors. And so, but we do see this over and over. And, and my father, who treated over a thousand men, when he would ask his clients, tell me, tell me about your father's relationship with his father. And sometimes he'd have the fathers there in, in the therapy session and he would ask them. Oh, yikes. Oh, yikes. Imagine you're like, oh, you're gay, you're maybe, I don't know, 15 or 16, you go to therapy, your dad's maybe not always been like super involved in your life, maybe just working a lot or just like you're just closer to your mom or whatever. And then they, your parents find out you're gay, your dad puts you into therapy and goes, also, I'm going with you. In the, if, if it's a case where dad is like emotionally abusive, now Dad and the therapist are probably emotionally abusing you. Well, that that sounds fuck, fucking awesome. Good job to this guy. Good job to Joseph Nicol, Nicolosi Sr., I suppose. You, Nicolosi Sr., I was like, you know, oh, you're emotionally abusive to your gay son. Well, let me join in. Let me join in on that shit. We'll fix this kid. Those fathers would virtually never talk about their fathers, in other words, the grandfathers of the gay sons, in warm terms. It was usually like, yeah, my father, he was okay, but they rarely spoke it in a warm, endearing, endearing way. Okay, so I want to I want to get back just briefly. You mentioned the hostile older, older brother. The it says in the book it says the brother is likely to be feared and the relationship will be hostile. Everything comes easy to him, especially in sports. And that also the father and the and this older brother typically get along better and share interests and are more alike. Why is that relationship hostile? So there there might older there's brother. okay, a couple things. Uh there might be uh, how much older if your brother's like eight years older than you are and you're eight and your older brother's sixteen, yeah, your father your brother and your dad are gonna relate on in a much different <clears throat> way because your brother who's sixteen when you're eight, your brother's almost an adult and your father's gonna hopefully act accordingly whereas you're eight and you're not almost an adult and hopefully your father acts accordingly there too like what the fuck brother there are probably several factors one of which is that the boy may be picking up on the fact that the younger brother has a special relationship there's a specialness that the younger brother has with the mother and so the boy is feeling mm -hmm a bit left out and there could be a little bit of joke but then whoa 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 mm. now now i'm confused another component of this is that the father is letting him get away with it so so the father's not intervening and so the boy just keeps bullying because it apparently is okay with dad and sometimes the dad is even I won't say encouraging, but he's he's letting it happen because he thinks, look, it's it's best for this young boy. It'll toughen him up. And so through his side, what kind of is <clears throat> like there's going to be siblings are going to fight. They're going to bicker. They're going to the older sibling is likely to pick on the younger sibling. And it's not always best to intervene every time. It, like, what is the nature of this? Is this constant? <clears throat> These are judgment calls that parents have to make giving the okay in some of these situations mm -hmm. and so those are some factors that may be present 
But it really is the father's job to put a stop to this. In all cultures, in all cultures, it doesn't matter which, when the father picks up on the fact that, a, a, that the younger brother is being routinely bullied by the older brother, it is incumbent upon the, it, it is incumbent upon the father to intervene. Oh, why the father specifically? These fathers, for a variety of reasons, are, are not doing that. Well, I'll tell you the reason my father didn't intervene is uh, he thought, and, you know, he didn't know, he didn't know any better, but he thought that this kind of was, was quote, unquote, toughening me up. Like it was going to make me more tough. What What my father didn't know... <laughs> <laughs> is that was going to make me even more gay or more, you know, whatever the, let's just use the term gay. Cause it's, it's well, easy. Let <laughs> I'm sorry. This isn't fun. This is, this is fucking tragic. But can we say this? Let's, let's be even more specific. That bullying adds another compounding factor that reinforces for the boy his notion that he really is different from other males around him. Mm -hmm. He is a different type of guy. And so when we have the liability of specialness with the mother, the, the detached critical relationship with the father, well, the, the bullying with the brother, the fact that the dad isn't putting a stop to it, each of these layers confirms the notion that I guess I really am different from other guys. And I'm going to borrow a phrase from one of your other guests, uh, Rosaria Butterfield, who used the term ontological. She taught yeah. me what ontological. I went ontological. <laughs> now I love ontological. Mm. <clears throat> so it was from watching your other guests talk about ontolo this is this is an argument about on this is an ontological argument. Is the boy just gay at his core and he was born that way, or is there a different explanation? But when you add each of these factors on, it reinforces the notion that I guess I'm just ontologically different. I'm just I just belong over here, not with these other guys. And then when the same sex attractions occur, that can also reinforce I guess I am different. And then when the boy hears from the culture, oh, you have these feelings, that's just who you are. You're gay. And the gay yeah, that's fine. <laughs> That's what the culture should. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, at an age, you know, an appropriate age. I don't know if a five-year-old's like, I like boys more than girls. You just go, oh, whatever. You know, you know, maybe, maybe that'll change one day. Maybe that'll change one day, but that's fine. Go play with your friends or whatever. Leave the door open. <laughs> but if it gets to the point where you know the kid starts you know going starts going through puberty and still likes uh, boys not girls you're like oh, I don't know you might be gay well that's fine do your homework label we're, we're talking about later on the boys development right but the label bring it does two things first of all it brings a sense of relief like well there's a there's an there's a, a reason i have these feelings and there's an explanation for why i felt different for so long so mm -hmm. the gay label brings a sense of relief but it also reinforces the boy's notion that he really is different from other boys around him now we even have a name no for he's not he that's really the, that's that's stupid too because i have more in common with some of like with some of my straight friends than i do with my gay friend like what the fuck is this guy talking about and so each of these factors just loads onto this sense for the boy that he is categorically separate from other males. Okay, so I just want to quote this and see. Yeah, what but then how does this guy explain like that? How does this guy explain that that a lot of dudes have like a best friend who's gay? I grew up with this person all my life, and I didn't know till they were like fifteen. They told me they were gay, but this, you know, was my best friend since school. Like, what the fuck, dude? Responses from the book um gradually inevitably the the boy begins to develop a fascination for that essential part of his own identity that he has failed to claim he will begin to seek it out it out there quote unquote in the whoa 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 wait a minute wait a minute whoa 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 if all these gay people are like not in touch with their own masculinity and they're out there <clears throat> in search of masculine men to identify with or whatever then how the fuck are they going to find a gay masculine man to identify with? Because all the other gay guys are just a fucking uh, totally in touch with their mom and all fucking not in touch with their own masculinity. So how, like now bullshit bullshit. 
feeling intense romantic longings. In puberty, these longings for his own masculine power will become eroticized. So when I work, I'll, I'll just speak about the clients who I've seen. <clears throat> when a client comes in, well, sometimes... Well, 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 why? I'll ask my client, tell me about your ideal sexually attractive guy. What would that guy be? Give me a, a description and we'll go in, you know, is he, is he taller than you? Is he shorter? What color is his hair? Was he, is he, what's his personality? How does he dress? Get, get specific. If you're attracted, sexually attracted to a part of his body, what, be precise. What is it? His abs and his legs? What is it? Do you want more body hair or less? Well, it, we're going to put this therapist in horny jail pretty soon here. It's like this whole exhaustive list. And, but like, I know so many gay guys who I'm like, Oh, maybe I think they're attractive or whatever. And then they date guys and I'm like, I don't think, you know, I don't, I'm not looking at like, Oh, I have a boyfriend. I meet their boyfriend. And I'm like, Oh, your boyfriend's cool. I'm not ever like, well, I'm not attracted to him. Cause if I did that, my friend would be like, well, that's good. Cause he's not your fucking boyfriend. Or maybe that person would be like, I don't think I want to be your friend anymore. Why would you, why would you say a thing like that? Once you've got that list, I'll say, okay, great. Now let's switch gears. Let's talk about the kind of man you would like to be. Any body you'd like, any attitude you'd like, any, what would that be? And so often my clients find that what they are attracted to in another man is what they would like in themselves. Mm. When, Straight people too, right? It's not always going to be, but you're like, oh, I'd like some, you know, straight people, they might aspire to. In fact, I think that like, if you're in love with somebody, you are probably going to aspire to some of their better qualities and wish you were more like them. We see this again and again and again. The psychoanalysts had a name for this. They called this eroticized envy. So we see this over and over and it's not true for all of them, but I would say for about 80% of my clients, that's, that's what we see. And then you, it's right. But that's because, oh, this is so stupid. You're like, oh, I'm attracted. <clears throat> You're like, I think this person is hot. I wish I was hot like them. <laughs> I think straight guys like do it with each other. I mean, they don't do it with each other because then that would make them at least hetero flexible. But if you're like, if, if, you know, maybe you're not attracted to them, but you want to be their friend. You want to be around them. You want to be in their social circle. And Maybe you aspire to some of their better qualities, be they physical or like the way they interact with other people. Like, I think this is just like, I think this is called liking someone, right? Like if you really like someone, I think it's likely that you might aspire to be like them in certain ways, be they physical or again, the way they interact with other people and, and navigate the world. That's why you would like somebody you're impressed by something about them. Like Fellas, fellas, man, others. Is it gay to aspire to the the good qualities of the people in your life? <laughs> Stick features we have often seen in homosexually oriented men include self preoccupation, emotional distancing, excessive concern with external appearances, restricted self insight, uh, a tendency to choose image over substance, and a ten tendency to be easily hurt and offended by others. This is a well. Wait a minute. A tendency to be easily hurt or offended. If you live in a, oh no, if you live in a world where you walk down the street and somebody yells the f slur out of their car at you because you like, I don't know, maybe they you appear to be gay or maybe they just guessed right. Then yeah, I mean you're gonna maybe be a little more offended by other people because they're gonna say fucking offensive things to you. Luckily, like at least you know here in the Bay Area and most major cities in the U.S., like gay people don't have to worry about this stuff as, as much. It's not that it never happens, but that doesn't have to worry about it as much. In in gay culture, I mean, when I was living that life and all my friends, we would talk about this all the time. We talk about how gay men are so concerned about their bodies that those are like healthy conversations to have with your gay friends. You're like, are we shallow? Those are like healthy conversations to have with your other gay friends it's introspective you're talking about yourself your community and how how you treat each other within this community these are ve these are sounds like he had like really good friends before he became ungay whatever the fuck that looks like gym bunnies <laughs> they were but that's not everybody's type and so what is why 
why do you because that's i mean that's been my experience is gay men are so kind of fastidious about their appearance and what what do you think that man this guy really did not handle twink death very well did he caused by there are probably several factors one is as we talked about earlier the the boys propensity to uh, sensitivity and awareness of aesthetics that might have a partial genetic contrib uh, contribution there there might be a partial mm -hmm. explanation for that but <clears throat> many of my clients um, felt that because of the the constellation of factors they had growing up they felt insecure in their sense of maleness and in their sense of male worth yeah that's because like many of your I assume that many of this guy's clients are like like my age cohort or older and there was a stigma about being gay it made you straight guys would call each other the f slur to like insinuate that they were n not real men or whatever um where i was at it didn't get thrown around a lot at high school but i bet 10 years before i went to high school it got thrown around a lot at high school in high school and it wasn't necessarily because you thought somebody was gay. You were just trying. It was a way to try to emascul emasculate someone else. And so like the gay people that see that see that are going to that is going to have an impact on them. And so they would sometimes try to counterbalance that by mm -hmm. really looking good, by really looking uh, by by putting perhaps an inordinate amount of attention into how they're coming off. Um, I think there's. So but people who are marginalized by he's just describing code switching like at least in the the part about how how you're coming off is called code switching maybe you should get to talk to some black people about sometimes being a little concerned about how you're coming off maybe around a group of people that are different than you i don't know not mentioned this guy's clients are all white i have seen it with my clients um in a in a random sampling of the general population obsessive compulsive disorder shows up about three to five percent so three to five percent of a random sampling of the population meets the criteria for ocd mm -hmm. with my clients it's 33 percent but this is a self-selecting group of people not just people who are gay but people who are gay and don't want to be gay and then people who thought that they were going to go get ungayed by this guy this guy's clientele is like no shit there's there's going to be like a whole other set of issues with the people that either i don't know if he his clients are all adults or if he at some point was doing like trying to do conversion therapy on people's kids or or whatever but yeah you're 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 definitely um it's, a, it's definitely an interesting and um a small sampling of uh, gay men and I'm not the only one seeing this. So the American Psychological Association says there is no connection whatsoever between homosexuality and ele elevated levels of pathology. They, they strongly imply that. Okay, there was- No, I don't think they strongly imply that. I think they say that. And I think they're right. Whew. We're about an hour and a half in, so uh, we're gonna watch the rest of this during the post game because there's a lot going on here. Um, Listeners on the podcast uh, version of this show on like Spotify or Apple Podcasts or whatever, you can get the rest of the show. Um, five bucks a month, patreon.com slash echoplex or eplex.store. Um, this is so weird because <clears throat> we're, it's, we're, as a, at least in, in America, we're just coming out of this shit. We're just coming out of it. Things perfect now. Do we have work to do? Absolutely. But we're just coming out of this. And so it's going <clears> to, <throat> it's going to take a generation or two for the impacts of rampant homophobia to stop being, to stop, I guess, having, to stop having a thumb on the scale of <clears throat> all this stuff in the profound way that it has for most of American history. You know, if, <clears throat> if you're always worried that people are going to judge you for being gay, maybe you are going to be obsessed about how you look, how you come off. Are you making enough money? Are you performing well at work? 
Are you, are you making, do you have enough friends? All these things, because you, you grew up in a world where everybody was calling you a f at school. So yeah, that's going to have an impact on you. I was lucky if I was 10 years older, this, this, everything would be different. Everything. Or if I grew up, I don't know, not in the San Francisco Bay area, I think everything would be different for me. This is infuriating, but it's dumb enough that I'm not actually getting that mad. I think this is like dumb enough. And there's aspects of this, aspects of this, especially with this Bennett Cook guy that are, that are kind of funny. Not that I think that what this Bennett Cook guy clearly went through is funny, but there's stuff about it that's funny. So at least there's that. I don't know. <sighs> anyway, uh, thanks podcast listeners again, patreon.com slash echoplex or eplex.store. Five bucks a month, you get the entire show zapped to your email the day after the show records. Um, if you don't want to pay me for it, just email me. I'm not going to paywall a fucking MP3 for $5. That would be, that would be extremely weird. And with that, we're going to get out of here. Well, we're not getting out of here, but, you know, we're going to get ready to go on into red light. Um, we're going to play Boomers by Periscope. And uh, live viewers, as always, uh, stick around. We'll be back after I uh, pour a cocktail, change the color of the lights in this room. And um, I don't know, it won't be great, but the show will keep going.